Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all this afternoon uh, to our lecture. I'm Joe Kibbe, and I'm the chair of the Miller Endowment Committee. And basically, I'm here just to bring a quick word from our sponsor. This lecture is part of the MillerCom 2009 series, made possible by an endowment established by George A. Miller. For those of you who don't know the Miller story, uh, Professor Miller was, a, by all accounts, humble and unprepossessing professor of math here in the 30s and 40s. And when he died, uh, his colleagues didn't, didn't think he even had enough money to pay for his funeral. He certainly didn't live very lavishly. And um, however, after his death, the, he had bequested to the university a rather sizable endowment of a million dollars that he had made in the stock market. Now, that was then, but and this is now, but the legacy of, George, of the George Miller Endowment has enabled the university to have a lecture series that is different from other lecture series on campus. On campus. One of the reasons is that it is competitive professors and others put forth uh, proposals to bring a speaker, and there's a committee that decides on, um, on which speakers will be chosen. And often what we're looking at is appeal across disciplines. This lecture tonight, we were speaking about this earlier, is a perfect example of interdisciplinarity, of cutting across disciplinary boundaries to bring together scholars across the university uh, to, to learn from each other's fields. And also, the MillerCom professors, or the MillerCom speakers, are expected to engage a lot on campus. They don't just come in and give a talk, but are involved with graduate students, with uh, undergraduate students, professors. Um, they give various uh, talks on campus, uh, lectures and seminars, and uh, they generally work pretty hard. So without further ado, though, I want to introduce the speaker to the speaker, and that is Professor Ma Mark McCauley from the History Department. And Professor McCauley is the one who did all the work to bring Professor Smale here. So, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as Joe Kibbe said, my name is Mark McCauley, and I teach in the uh, history department and was part of the um, collection of scholars who uh, uh, were able to bring our speaker to campus uh, for a three-day visit. Professor Daniel Lord uh, Smale is our speaker this evening. Professor Smale received his undergraduate education at the University of Wisconsin and his graduate training uh, in the field of European history uh, at the University of Michigan. He is trained, as some of you in the audience will know, as a specialist in uh, medieval, particularly late uh, medieval history, with an emphasis on the histories of France and Italy. After Madison and Ann Arbor, and beginning in 1994, Professor Smale taught for several years at Fordham University in New York City, where he was also uh, the director of Fordham's uh, Center uh, for Medieval Studies. Three years ago, he moved to Harvard University, where he is now a professor in the Department of History. Over the past 10 years, Professor Smale has been highly productive researching, writing, and publishing one book after another on an impressively wide variety of topics uh, concerning the life and society of uh, medieval Europe. His books have also been consistently uh, recognized for their high quality, for their high scholarly and intellectual quality. In 2001, his first book, Imaginary Cartographies, Possession and Identity in Late Medieval Marseille, won the American Historical Association's prestigious Herbert Baxter Adams Prize, uh, which is awarded yearly for the best uh, first book by an American scholar of European history. 
Likewise, just two years later, his book, The Consumption of Justice, a study of late medieval uh, legal cultures, was awarded the James Willard Hurst Prize of the Law and Society Association. Our speaker is also the co-editor of Fama, The Politics of Talk and Reputation in Medieval Europe, published in 2003, and the co-editor of a forthcoming uh, fascinating sounding volume that carries the title Vengeance and Emotion in Medieval Europe. Uh, however, it's Professor Smale's most recent publication uh, that in particular caught the attention of uh, many readers at the University of Illinois over the past year and has led to our efforts to bring him to us uh, as a Miller-Com speaker. This is the short but brilliant book that carries the intriguing title, On Deep History and uh, the Brain. On Deep History and the Brain, copies of which just happen to be uh, available in the lobby of the uh, Spurlock uh, Museum uh, for your sampling uh, after the lecture and during the reception to which the audience also is uh, invited. Uh, in this short but brilliant book, Professor Smale bravely tackles some of the methodological and philosophical issues involved with the idea of deep history. By deep history, he means the past of uh, the human species that long predates the advent of written uh, records and the ages of the famous ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia. This is a human past, needless to say, that dates not several thousand, uh, but hundreds of thousands of years back. Professor Smale argues in his provocative book that the widespread practice of historians ignoring the deep past of Homo sapiens is no longer tenable in light of recent and very exciting discoveries uh, in a variety of fields of scientific knowledge. Specifically, he uh, tries to persuade us new techniques, ideas, and methods in genetics, the neurosciences, archaeology, uh, and evolutionary psychology and biology, among other fields, are providing volumes of new information that is directly pertinent to the properly historical understanding of humanity. Historians, in other words, he is uh, arguing, uh, should no longer dismiss this long, earlier, preliterate period with the umbrella category of prehistory. As you can tell, Professor Smale's work is, uh, as Joe Kibbe already mentioned, highly interdisciplinary. Uh, and uh, likewise, it's not surprising that many uh, different departments and programs at the U of I were eager to bring him to campus. In addition to my home department of history, the departments of anthropology, psychology, philosophy, evolutionary and integrative biology, the program in the neurosciences, the unit for interpretive criticism, uh, IPRH and the Beckman Institute have all contributed to his uh, Miller-Com visit uh, for which my colleagues and I in history are deeply grateful. Perhaps the most provocative and contemporary part of On Deep History and the Brain, and this brings us to the subject of this afternoon's presentation, is Professor Smale's historical argument about neurochemistry. He insists that it is not just uh, our gross anatomical characteristics of human beings that evolved over thousands of generations, but also our brain chemistry. He maintains specifically that as human beings, we've been uniquely, we've proven uniquely capable over the centuries to induce, alter, uh, and enhance our mental states through a myriad of self-conscious chemical practices and for quite specific purposes. For instance, uh, the consumption of sugar, coffee, tea, tobacco, cheap alcohol, chocolate, herbs, medicines, illegal drugs, uh, all of which of course have their own histories, are practices that have stimulated the production of certain chemical messengers in the human brain that alter over time human moods and feelings 
and that, again, over an expanse of time, have influenced social and cultural practices. He also suggests that key group practices, such as, for instance, listening to music, dancing, attending a powerful sermon or political speech, viewing a film or sports event, accomplish this same uh, effect. These products and practices, needless to say, are proliferating greatly in our own time, our own age, with its iPods, video games, cable news, medical antidepressants, and electronic erotica, uh, as well as an endless number of other new varieties of human sensory stimulation. Together and over time, according to Professor Smale, uh, these sensory uppers, if you will, have had what he calls a profound neurophysiological consequence for our lives and our history. From birth to death, our actual brain synapses are shaped by these uniquely human uh, stimulants. Up to this point, according to Professor Smale, human history has almost entirely left out the uh, human brain, and he, in contrast, makes a compelling case in his book and in his comments today for writing what he terms the new neurohistory that attempts to integrate the findings of the neurosciences of our day into the writing of history. According to our speaker, if he has his way, brain chemistry too will appear on the History Channel. Uh, I hope it's clear from my introductory comments that Daniel Lord Smale is emerging today as one of the most wide-ranging, imaginative, and intellectually ambitious historians of our time. We're delighted and honored that he accepted our invitation to be a Millercom speaker. He has titled his presentation to us today, Is Culture Just a Drug? History, Neuroscience, and the Great Transformation. And I'm sure that with his lecture, uh, he will be stimulating our intellectual synapses. Professor Smale. Thanks, Mark. I, I just wanted to begin briefly by, by thanking the Miller Committee and, and, and all the sponsors for bringing me here. It's, it's been simply a marvelous visit. And I also wanted to thank uh, everyone here for the really warm and friendly reception I have had from colleagues that have, have allowed me into their homes and have gone out for dinner and, and really fabulous conversations. And, and the, actually, the wonderful uh, students I've met, both graduates and undergraduates, with uh, really great conversations uh, is what we're here for, is, is why we're in this business. Um, and, and particularly the departments of history uh, and neuroscience, or, or the program in neuroscience, and other departments. I, I've had, just had fabulous conversations with, with colleagues here, really, really stimulating. And a, a special thanks to, to Mark, uh, not only for his really generous comments, but, but uh, for his, his faultless and, and, and conscientious uh, building of the program and his, his stewarding of me uh, around campus. Um, I'd like to set the, the stage for this, this paper with a, with a roundabout literary introduction. Because the, the more I work on this argument, the more I realize it's already been made by someone before me. And in this case, the argument was prefigured by Aldous Huxley in his Brave New World uh, and by George Orwell in his better known novel, 1984. Uh, these two books were published 17 years apart. Uh, uh, Brave New World in 1932 and 1984, 1949. Uh, and, and the two of them offer competing images of the dystopian nightmare that might be the human fate. Both authors shared an intuition that cultural practices have drug-like effects and that political cultures are organized around the strategic manipulation of the human nervous system. So more than a half century ago, Huxley and Orwell invited us to build a neuroscientific approach to the path, and, and, and this is the invitation I, I want to take up today. Now, I, uh, Orwell, I'm going to just begin with a brief discussion of Orwell. He, he, he wrote in part as a horrified observer to the rise of modern public relations, and it's, uh, modern pub public relations is a field and technique that owes a lot to uh, the uh, enormous figure of Edward Bernays, uh, a nephew of, of Sigmund Freud, who's, who's often called the father of modern advertising. As Bernays explained in his 1928 work, uh, Propaganda, 
and he wrote about this in a positive way. It's important to understand that. If we understand the mechanisms and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing it? The recent practice of propaganda has proven that is possible. Hence Orwell's interest in the way languages and frames can twist and bend our ability to reason. But Oceania, this is Orwell's world, was, uh, was also a world of constant, never-ending stress, uh, which was visited on the body and the nervous system. So, so whereas we tend to think about Orwell in terms of the way in which he thought about thought control, there's a very powerful body and stress element that runs through the novel. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, you, you can think about the, 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 the supervision that is exercised through the two-way telescreens. Uh, like Bentham's Panopticon, the, the constant fear of the thought police. There's some marvelous passages, and I have to say, as I was rereading the novel recently, not having looked at it probably like most of you since high school, I, I was really struck by the way in which Orwell was con conscious of the regime playing on the bodies and emotions of the, of the subjects of uh, the citizens of the Brave New World to, to whip up uh, sentiments through the, the, the hate exercises that, that operated on various schedules. There's a very explicit comment when she, when, in which she des describes the importance of the suppression of sexual desire. And the reason why is that all of the energies uh, that people have have to be channeled into the, uh, into the hate exercises. And the, the regime did, does not want to make any antidote to the stress available um, to the people who are living in this world. There's a, there's a comment that the torturer O'Brien uh, makes uh, as, as the, the chief figure is undergoing the horrific scene at the end in which she says, we shall abolish the orgasm. So this is, this is a, a, a comment on, on the body element of, of Orwell. Now Huxley's model of totalitarianism worked in an entirely different way. I'm going to spend a little more time on Huxley because uh, fewer people have read Brave New World. Um, the, the psychological state generated in the Brave New World was not one of stress but one of pleasure. So somewhat later uh, in his essay in revisiting, um, in, in The Brave New World Revisited, Huxley wrote about Horwell, government through terror works on the whole less well than government through the nonviolent manipulation of the thoughts and feelings of individual men, women, and children. And the novel explores a nearly insoluble philosophical dilemma. If people are content in their own subjection, is it still subjection? The division of labor in the brave new world operates by means of child conditioning. And those of you who've read the novel will remember those opening scenes in which the controller describes how infants are, have, have been, uh, 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 the, the fetuses have been raised in artificial uteruses. They've been selected genetically and formed and shaped so that each one will be happy in the caste, the worker caste to which it has been assigned. Every single child undergoes this sleep conditioning that he called hypnopedia. And infants were des uh, who were destined to be workers were conditioned in Pavlovian ways to resist the allure of flowers and books, and especially mothers. And there's a really shocking scene in which uh, the, you, you can see uh, babies undergoing electroshock uh, as, as they're crawling towards these alluring figure, the alluring uh, flowers and books to shock them uh, in, into uh, a state of animus towards them. As adults, the, uh, the citizens of the Brave New World are subjected to an additional kind of day-to-day -day, uh, conditioning. For the controllers of the Brave New World freely distribute an opiate called Soma. Soma, we learn, has all the advantages of Christianity and alcohol. <laughs> None of their defects. Huxley here was alluding to Karl Marx's famous passage, uh, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. Religion in Marx's model is a cultural opiate. And this is a phrase that J.G.A. Pocock actually developed, uh, uh, the idea of a cultural opiate. That is to say, an institution or a practice that can have a soothing opiate-like effect on the body. Now, in the Brave New World, in Brave New World, Huxley turned Marx on his head because the opiate itself has become the religion of the people. And there's a marvelous scene in chapter five, this, this, this brilliant parody of the Eucharistic ceremony 
uh, which plays on this fortuitous pun because the word soma is, the, is a Vedic word for an actual opiate-like substance, a plant that was uh, described in the Vedas. But in Greek, it also means body. Now, the denizens of the brave new world are addicted to soma, and they, they pop several pills each day and, and, and never experience Suicide Tuesday. But they're also both stimulated and subdued by the endless recreations of the consumer paradise, the games, the dances, travel, the sensuous perfumed showers, the endless rounds of sex, all of them opiates or stimulants, albeit of a different kind. Now, as Richard Posner, in, the, in, a, in a really brilliant essay he's written about Huxley and Orwell, as he reminds us, Huxley was writing in the depths of a world depression. The Brave New World was the logical outcome of the Keynesian belief that consumption is the antidote to recession. So Huxley is seeing the historical trends that are leading to what he imagines will be the Brave New World. Chemical opiates on the one hand, cultural stimulants on the other. If the human goal is to pursue pleasure and avoid pain, if a regime has a total monopoly on the sources of pleasure, then that regime has created a realm of subjection like nothing ever seen before. Working together, the assemblage of opiates and stimulants available in the brave new world, both chemical and cultural, constitute an order so finely calibrated to the workings of the human nervous system that there can be no escape. The same is true for the assemblage of stressors in Orwell's Oceania, obviously operating on a different side of the spectrum. Hence, history itself has come to an end. And in describing the end of history's dialectic, Orwell and Huxley hint at a historical model, a great transformation, in which the native stimulants and stresses of the past yield uh, to a systematically designed array in the brave new world. Power, they suggest, is always mediated through the nervous system. The end of history comes about when a regime armed with a necessary technological apparatus hits upon the ideal combination of neurological controls. It's a dazzling and disturbing idea. For the purposes of this paper, I'd like to dispense with their intuition that transformations, uh, transformations of this type are guided by the hand of dictatorial regimes. I, just as a historian, I, I, I revel in the idea that the most interesting trends in history are those that emerge as the, as the unforeseen or unintended consequences of shifts in practice or thought. But when their model is purged of uh, this totalitarian fantasy, it offers a startling new way to think about the transformations of the past. And in this paper, what I'd like to do is offer a glimpse at what such a history could look like. And, and by way of case study, I will be focusing on uh, medieval and early modern Europe. But the model itself demands a framework that is both global and deep. I, I'm not really a European exceptionalist. It just happens to be the, the world that I know a little better. As various observers have noted, medieval Europe was a region of the world generally poor in psychopharmacological substances. Now, there were plenty of cultural practices that impinged on the nervous system. Um, and I describe these, I'll, I'll be describing these as, as components of a distinctive assemblage of traits that emerged in stages along with the rise of Latin Christendom. Across the long 18th century, the century 1650, 1680 onwards, uh, a different assemblage of traits comes together. And, and this transformation has two key elements. First, the exchange of psychopharmacological substances like caffeine and opium accelerated all over the world. Uh, and the historian David Courtright has called this the psychoactive revolution. Patterns of use changed. To take but one example, coffee, which was a, had hitherto been a medicine, became a luxury, an adjunct to entertainment, and eventually a staple. Expanding production led to a growing density of psychoactive substances in, in, in all global societies, not just Europe, but throughout the world. Second, there were transformations in the basic profile of available cultural practices that impinged on the nervous system, as evidenced by the luxury debates, the mania for collecting, the passions aroused by theater, and especially the anxieties surrounding what was known as reading mania or reading fever. It was a century, remarkably, in which contemporary observers were aware of the changing forms of addiction. So I've, I've organized this paper into, into three main sections. And the, the first one is going to be thinking historically with the brain. Um, and then some perspectives on, on the cultural stimulants of medieval Europe. And finally, some thoughts on these, uh, these trends I've been 
uh, dashing over for the long 18th century. And the resulting model is, is really very schematic and provisional. And, and in building it, I've been aware of how I, I've cherry picked examples from a variety of incommensurable sources. And I, I've gaily skirted dense methodological and epistemological thickets. So I, I, I want you to treat this as a working hypothesis and, and, and I hope an outline for research. And I, I really value comments and thoughts that, that people would have. So let me begin um, thinking historically with the brain um, and, and just begin with a very short nod to the fields of biological anthropology and, and paleohistorical archaeology, which I've been trying to, 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 to learn about lately. Um, it's a field, as Mark was mentioning in his opening comments, has really developed spectacularly in the last decade or two, in part because of uh, the effect of population genetics on the field, new methods for dating, the kinds of insights that can be drawn from isotopic analyses of bone and teeth. Uh, the really new work on ancient DNA that's being done by Svante Pavo's lab and many other labs uh, around the world were actually reconstituting Neanderthal and early human DNA and comparing it with modern DNA. Um, and the emergence of the, the field of cognitive archaeology. Um, and it's all leading to this really robust un, a new understanding of early human history. And this is sort of part of my model that this history is so robust now that we historians like me really need to start thinking of this in conjunction, in connection with the history that we, we typically have, have thought about. Um, one of the most significant questions is also the one that has probably been around for the, the longest. And this is the growth of the human brain. The changing uh, size and shape of the brain case is easily graphed. And what that graph illustrates is a pattern of punctuated growth from the Australopithecine brain down to the modern brain. Now, the brain is really expensive tissue. And the large skulls are dangerous for both mothers and neonates. So what was the evolutionary benefit that offset the considerable costs of the large brain? And this has sort of been the holy grail of, of uh, biological anthropology for uh, ever since the turn of the century, really. One of the most vigorous arguments lately is, is the social intelligence hypothesis. Uh, and this is an hypothesis that builds off the idea that humans have lived in cooperative groups for nearly two million years and are dependent on altruism like no other species. The brain accordingly grew to keep track of credits and debts, social alliances, and social standing. And this new social context placed a premium on the ability to accurately read and act on social signals. Um, and this is what uh, Simon Baron Cohen in his studies on autism has called mind reading. And in the, in the metaphor that's been proposed by Kim Sterelny and Paul Griffiths, this situation created uh, what they're calling a cognitive arms race, where the most important selection pressure was not the changing environment, not the use of tools, but the need to keep up with everyone else's mind reading ability. Now, the changing use of the brain pushed the evolution of practices or mechanisms that interact with the dopamine reward system and the, and the stress response system. Um, and, and these are really, truly ancient systems found in all reasonably complex animal species. That's why we can do experiments with rats and export them onto humans. Uh, for animals need to receive pleasure for doing good things and pain for doing bad ones. Basic biology. In social species, the two systems are harnessed to the demands of cooperative life. Pro-social activity generates a reward. Stress mounts that the animal is at odds with or isolated from the group. The sensory deprivation experiments first conducted on, on human subjects uh, at McGill University uh, in, in the 1950s vividly illustrate this point. And I'm, I'm sure some of you are much more familiar with this than, than I am. Um, subjects who were, who were isolated from sensory input, they wore frosted goggles, gloves, placed in solitary rooms white noise to distract them from any uh, noise in the environment, the subjects would begin to hallucinate often within a day or two. And, and none apparently lasted in isolation more than about a week. Uh, horrifying studies conducted in the 1970s showed that newborn rhesus macaque monkeys went psychotic and suffered permanent neurological damage after being isolated for several months in the aptly named pit of despair. And obviously, these studies are, are well known to, to people in the neurosciences, in part because they created such impediments for doing future research, perhaps, perhaps justifiably, <laughs> but I, I can leave that to other people to decide. Um, key to the psychological process is the need felt by most primates for daily contact. As the psychologist and primatologist Robin Dunbar has argued, grooming is not just about parasites. It is, uh, it is crucial for building and maintaining social relations. Grooming generates a pleasant dose of dopamine and serotonin, uh, along with oxytocin, uh, the peace and bonding neurotransmitter. 
language, according to, to, to Robin Dunbar, and this is a really fascinating model he developed uh, recently, language allows for gossip, which is the kind of verbal grooming. So using gossip, what humans can do in effect is extend the reach of chemical bonding, if I can use that word, across a much larger network. In practice, this means that humans can live in groups of unlimited size, unlike other primates, where you have caps largely on group size. It's actually strongly correlated with the size of the neocortex. Dunbar's insight is key to answering one of the great questions we ask today, we in, in history perhaps, namely how large imagined communities were made possible. In both birds and mammals, the sensitivity of this neurochemical system makes it susceptible to psychoactive substances. And this is why a lot of animals and birds like to partake in alcohol and, and, and other substances, right? Um, but the system is also open to things you do to yourself, and especially open to things that other people do to you. The nervous system is like an array of Geiger counters, constantly measuring the signals bouncing around the social environment. Most of the processing takes place without our full awareness. And Edward Bernays has built an industry on this understanding. But Bernays was not the first person to make this observation. Writing in the mid-16th century, I'm afraid I'm being a rah-rah humanist here, right? The French essayist Etienne de la Boétie observed that theaters, games, plays, spectacles, marvelous beasts, Metals, tableau, and other such drugs, and the, words he, the word he used was la droguerie, were for the people of antiquity the allurements of serfdom, the price for their freedom, the tools of tyranny. To be enticed by what Juvenal had called bread and circus was to submit to voluntary servitude. Now, La Boétie's idea of voluntary servitude was an early contribution to a long intellectual thread leading through Marx and Gramsci and beyond, uh, well, to Huxley, and then beyond to the uh, cultural critique of late capitalism that was, that's found in Neil Postman's 1985 work, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have, have read. Now, primatologists have described a daily dialectic between the stress response system and the dopamine reward system. Dominant males and females visit stress on subordinates, the better to maintain their own high rank. Pleasurable grooming and same-sex sexuality among primates helps to build and repair social bonds and alliances. So you get this sort of dialectic back and forth on a, on a daily basis. Among humans, the daily dialectic between the dopamine reward system and the stress response system is also a kind of historical dialectic. The neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky has uh, offered the most vivid uh, point of departure for this argument. Um, this, uh, stress, he argues, uh, is distributed unequally across the social spectrum. And he's drawing his, his material from the, his studies of stress in modern populations. The poorer you are, he argues, typically the more stress you endure. The transitions that have taken place in recent human history, that is to say the, the last 10,000 years or so, have created hierarchies of wealth and power that have institutionalized forms of stress. This, this is the key to this, this argument that Sapolsky is developing. Now what I think we need to add to Sapolsky's observation is the possibility that institutional stress can be balanced by practices that relieve stress and provide diversions. These could be cultural, as La Boétie divined, but they can also be psychopharmacological. Uh, and just to take a modern example, and this is from a work I was flipping through recently by Frank de Couter and his, his co-authors, um, they, they've argued uh, that consumption of opium in the Chinese countryside in the 19th century tended to in increase in times of malnutrition. Um, and for them it's interesting because this confused foreign observers as they passed through the so-called opium villages for the, uh, these Western observers would see the starving people and blame the opium and not the famine. The institutionalized forms of stress that emerged in agrarian and post-agrarian societies prompted a growing human investment in opiates and pleasurable stimulants of all kinds, whether they're, they're chemical or, and cultural. And a whole economy came to be harnessed to this task. This model proposes then that, that human history has been shaped by a continuous dialectic between the dopamine reward system and the stress response system. The dialectic was initiated in Africa some two million years ago with the emergence of hominins and cooperative living. Uh, it's been fed by the cognitive arms race and especially by human, changing human population densities. Significant steps were taken after the modern humans colonized the globe starting around 85,000 years ago, which is a little about coterminous with the emergence of, uh, of what's been called symbolic thought. 
Um, agriculture, cities, and whole civilizations added new wrinkles to this dialectic. Now, Huxley, to go back to some of the images I was setting up at the beginning of this talk, Huxley imagined that this dialectic could come to an end with the, the victory of pleasure, as it were, or well-favored stress. Like most of you, I hope, I, like most of you, I, I suspect that the dialectic is never ending. Um, but I, I sometimes worry that Huxley was right after all. And frankly, if you start to Google Huxley uh, around this question, you'll find that this is the, the, the concern that lots and lots of, of bloggers and essayists are having. You know, was Huxley right? Uh, yeah, so, so Huxley is now, this is the Huxley-Orwell <laughs> comparison. Huxley is now rising and Orwell's declining in, in some funny, interesting way. Now, do we need the language of neuroscience to talk about changing patterns of reward in, and stress in human society? And the answer clearly is no. The reason I've offered you the insights of figures like Laboiti and Marx and Huxley and Orwell is to show how this stuff has long been obvious to humanist observers. But the neurobiology is helpful for it shows us, uh, shows that there is no meaningful distinction between cultural practices and psychoactive substances. Both kinds of inputs input are translated into the language of the nervous system. That, that language consists of synapses and neurochemicals and a hideously complex grammar. Um, and I have to say, the more I look at it, the more I, I quake at the, at the complexity of the grammar of this language. At the level of the synapse, the effect of cultural traits and practices is very similar to the effect of psychoactive substances. Culture is indeed a drug. But drugs themselves are part of culture, delivered by commerce and bound up in ritual forms. Patterns of use can and do change significantly from one historical society to another. So it is all one. Now this insight allows us to fashion a category of analysis that embraces cultural stimulants along with their psychoactive counterparts. And I call these collectively psychotropic mechanisms, uh, the spectrum of devices, practices, or substances available in any culture that alter the nervous system to greater or lesser degrees and perform political or social work. Every political society has a characteristic assemblage of psychotropic mechanisms. And the history I'm proposing, therefore, is a history of transformation in psychotropic assemblages. So let me move on to the, the second major part of my paper, which is uh, offering you just some brief thoughts and case studies from medieval Europe. Now, medieval Latin Christendom toward the end of the first millennium was a world tucked away in the northwest corner of the old world and a remove from the vibrant civilizations and trade networks that stretched from Al-Andalus to the Song Dynasty China. Gone were the psychotropic mechanisms of the ancient world, the theaters, games, and spectacles described by La Boite, to which you could have added an eroticism worthy of the brave new world. Europe at this time was a, world, was a world in which the luxury items of the age, such as gold and ivory, the spices, the fine silken fabrics of the great Islamic and Chinese civilizations were all imported, mostly in exchange for slaves, and did not circulate much outside the great secular and ecclesiastical courts. There's, there's actually a lot more archaeological debate about that claim of mine, so I'd have to defend it if there were some medieval archaeologists here. It was a world largely bereft of psychoactive substances. Other old world societies had their tea, their coffee, hashish, and marijuana, opium, even the soma of the Vedas, and there's, there's actually lots more. In new world societies obviously had long since discovered coca, tobacco, peyote, a variety of hallucinogens uh, that are circulating throughout the, uh, the Caribbean and the Amazon basin. Now none of this was native as a, as, as a plant or a substance to the European backwater. Now the major exception to this was alcohol. Richard Unger has argued that Northern Europeans consumed at least a quart of ale or small beer every day. It was probably a lot more than that. Um, matched in southern latitudes by wine. And, 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 and as you uh, contemplate these statistics, it's, it's hard to avoid the impression of a continuously in, intoxicated society. Um, and Wolfgang Schovelbusch, indeed, has described a great transformation from what he called, I love this term, the alcoholic stupor of the Middle Ages to the common sense industry um, uh, of the caffeinated middle class culture of early modern Europe. <laughs> uh, but this is an egregious misreading of the medieval evidence. Medieval wines, ales, and beers had lower alcohol content uh, than their modern counterparts. Wine was a thin and vinegary substance with an alcoholic content of, of usually no more than about 5%. And even, even then, it was typically mixed with water for drinking. Um, 
Ales and beers made from the first wort were not necessarily weaker than modern beer. This is a question of, of the, the, the strain of yeast that's being used. Um, but Brewsters drew second and even third worts off the grain, unlike typically modern brewers, um, which re resulting in small beer with very little alcohol content. Uh, and, and this, the small beer was the, was the, in fact, the beer that was most commonly consumed. Um, it, was, it was stirred up, cooked up in a breakfast porridge for peasants. That was a very common way in which the beer was consumed. Um, alcoholic beverages were consumed for health and dietary reasons. Recreation was not the chief function. As Unger has put it bluntly, the society did not know about alcoholism. Now, medieval Latin Christendom, in short, was a world in which the range of psychotropic uh, mechanisms was largely restricted to the things people do rather than the things people ingest. How do we find evidence for these things? How do we describe the psychotropic assemblage of medieval Europe when we are necessarily limited to indirect evidence and inferential arguments? Now, happily, medieval Europe, uh, although psychopharmacologically poor, was rich in texts and other sources, which is the reason that I find it a fascinating world to study. Not because it's the origins of the modern world, but because it's a richly documented early society. And in recent work, I've been taking two approaches to the evidence. First of all, swings in body states express themselves on the outside of the body in the form of emotional displays or somatic gestures like blushing, pallor, fainting, sighs, tears, and, and so on. There's a whole range of these somatic gestures. Um, and by way of example, let me offer you the marvelous description found in Raymond of Capua's Life of St. Catherine, which was written about 1380. Um, in addition to everything else that she did, Catherine was a, was a peacemaker. Um, and, and one day Raymond sought out her, her help in, in pacifying a, a troublesome Florentine, um, um, sorry, a Siena named Nanni di Servanni. Catherine's entreaties seemed to be going nowhere, but with great ill grace, um, Nanny finally agreed to let her try and resolve one of the feuds that he has. And, and, and this is how, how Raymond describes the climactic scene. I have four feuds, says Nanny. As to one of them, you can do what you like about it. Having said this, he got up and made to go. But as he did so, he exclaimed, my God, how contented I feel in my soul from having said I shall make peace. And he went on, Lord God, what power is this that draws and holds me? I cannot go away, and I cannot say no. Who has taken my liberty from me? What is stopping me? And with this, he burst into tears. I own myself beaten, he said. I cannot breathe. He fell on his knees and said, weeping, most holy virgin, I will do as you say. In addition to offering somatic gestures like tears and, and, and constriction of the chest, that's, that's one of the ones that Raymond's writing about here, medieval observers sometimes describe interesting body states without using somatic terminology. So just by way of example, when Catherine first arrives at the house where Raymond's trying to set up this piece, um, Raymond describes himself as being filled with, with joy. Sifting through medieval texts, we find many bodies that are moved by joy or happiness. We find descriptions of compulsive behaviors. We find things that soothe as well as things that excite and agitate. Descriptions like these are scattered thinly, I have to acknowledge that, thinly but meaningfully across a variety of genres. As it happens, they are virtually non-existent in, in the legal contracts and court records that most of my prior research has been, has been based on. These are the, the books that, that Mark mentioned. They are most common in narratives such as chronicles, epics, and romances, as well as uh, moral treatises and, and letters. So what happens when we take a census of these observations and explore the contexts in which they are found? Yes, literary descriptions are often stylized and conventional. But even if we cannot know whether, taking some examples, whether Saint Dominic wept copiously during his prayers, or whether El Cid's eyes filled with tears as he groveled before his sovereign Alfonso, his mouth full of grass. We can perhaps draw legitimate inferences from the fact that tears are conventionally found in circumstances involving religious devotion and public self-humiliation. Now, in the interest of time, let me give you some of the highlights of my very preliminary census. And th these are things I've been just working on for the last few months. Um, attributions of joy, ecstasy, tears, great exhalations show up in many contexts. 
Not surprisingly, the uh, evidence is skewed to religious experiences, and I'm just going to run through a, 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 the example of sermons. Observers, um, uh, in general, were, were really sensitive to the psychology of crowds. In their accounts, we find rare but interesting descriptions of collective tears, sighs, and groans in response to sermons. Medieval authorities on the art of preaching, as Beverly Keensel has observed, advised preachers to go carefully. If the audience is weeping too heavily, ease back a bit. As one of my graduate students has pointed out, a remarkable thing about the sermons, the sermons of the great mendicant preachers, is that they were held out of doors. And if you've ever given or attended any speech out of doors without a microphone, you'll know that the audible range of an outdoor talk is very restricted. Yet the descriptions of audiences at medieval sermons sometimes suggest crowds numbering in the thousands, especially as the, the, the mendicant preaching really takes off in the 13th and 14th centuries. Most of them, most of them could not have heard the content of the sermon. The messages conveyed during a sermon were therefore as much visceral as they were intellectual. And experts on sermons, uh, like Keynesville, agree that listeners experience sermons as a form of theater, complete with joys and sorrows and great swings in mood. So the suggestion here is that they're responding as much to the somatic responses of the people in head of the, ahead of them, and that the message is traveling back through bodies as much as it is through ears. Now, surveying this evidence, it is clear that the cultural stimulants of medieval Europe were marked uh, by the context of publicity. When you look at the, the things involving sermons and many of the other contexts I've looked at, uh, you, you find this publicity in a lot of them. Geoffrey Caudill describes scenes of begging pardon and favor where audiences were moved to tears and exhalations as the supplicant prostrated himself in public, his arms outstretched in the form of a cross. Now, this is not to say that men and women in the Middle Ages were never moved in solitary ways, and, and sort of, you know, for specialists, one thinks of the, uh, 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 of the tears, the constant tears of Marjorie Kemp. Nonetheless, solitary pleasures are not nearly as marked in medieval sources as they come to be in the 18th century. This is context of publicity you see so often. Medieval sources describe people who were moved in the context of interpersonal relations, especially in situations laced with power, competition, and coercion, uh, such as the uh, enormous burden of expectation that Catherine had laid upon Nani di Servani. A close study I've made of the somatic gestures in the old French rep, uh, epic Raoul de Cambrai confirms the point. There's about 100 somatic phrases in, in, in this poem, uh, and almost all occur in contexts that a primatologist like Franz Duval would instantly recognize as contests over rank order. Perhaps above all, here and throughout the sources I've looked at, we find descriptions of people being moved in situations involving relationships between people and not between people and commodities. There are major exceptions to this. Um, um, I'm thinking of the joys derived from plundering. It's a very common convention we see in, in texts involving the Crusades and other expansionary movements. Um, the, the ecstasy reported during the bonfire of the vanities in Savonarola's Florence. But even so, this was not a world marked by what psychotherapy is now calling compulsive shopping disorder, a disorder that we now know is driven by the uh, dopamine reward system. Medieval Europe had its compulsions. God knows it had lots of compulsions. But by and large, they were not solitary compulsions, and they were not commodity-centered compulsions. Now, in his essay comparing Huxley and Orwell, Richard Posner has noted that Orwell's joyless Oceania was modeled on medieval Christendom. So go back and read the novel with this in mind, and you'll find it reads totally differently. The two-way telescreens, the thought police disguising itself as the ministry of love, the exercises in hate, the suppression of sexual desire, these, Posner tells us, are barely concealed allusions to the disciplinary regime of confession, the regime of inquisitorial terror functioning under the banner of Christian love, the frenzied sentiments directed against witches and heretics, and the joyless sexual puritanism fostered by the medieval ascetic tradition. Almost nothing in the 20th century can escape the image of the medieval at, at some point or another, as this, as this shows. If this preliminary census that I've done has any merit, it shows that the world of medieval Europe was nothing 
like the world of Oceania. Every medievalist today knows this. I do think that medieval European society was a high-stress society, not unlike the uh, Oceania in that regard. And, and my current very specialized research on financial insolvency in 14th century Marseille, I know it's very fashionable to write about bankruptcy in the 14th century in this particular climate, um, and, and, and Luca, suggests that debt recovery was a, was a high-stress operation involving ample opportunities for public humiliation. But this, this stress was visited upon debtors by their creditors in much the same way that stress was decentralized and interpersonal among the military aristocrats described in the poem Raoul de Cambrai. So this is not Orwell's world in which the mechanisms for delivering stress have been gathered into the hands of Big Brother. And this is the great fantasy of the Middle Ages, that there was a Big Brother there and that it was the Christian church. It's nothing like that. The other thing we learned from this brief survey of the medieval psychotropic assemblage is that Marx was wrong. This was not a world in which religion operated as a cultural opiate. Religion, to the extent that it can be separated from other forms of theater and ritual, and obviously I think it, it can't be, shows up far more often as a stimulant and even a stressor. Religion may have had an opiate-like function in Marx's day, I, I make no comment on that, and perhaps it serves that function today, but that was not how it worked for most of the laity in medieval Europe. So let me move on then to the, to the, uh, the final section in which I begin to talk about the, the so-called great transformation of the long 18th century. Um, in speaking of the great transformation, I'm alluding to Karl Polanyi's great work of the same name published in 1944, in which he described a total transformation in which the ageless order of society gave way across the 18th and 19th centuries to a market society. In the wake of Polanyi, many authors have proposed other models of transformation. And the litany of institutions or isms whose birth or origins can be located in early modern Europe, uh, or for that matter, in early modern China, I've just been getting into the Chinese literature and find the arguments almost identical there, would be a tedious one indeed, ranging from proto-industrialization, consumerism, the public sphere, and the modern world system, to possessive individualism, self-fashioning, the disciplinary regime, and the two-sex model of gender norms. Medieval historians like me read figures like Emmanuel Waterstein and Jürgen Habermas and Michel Foucault and Tom LeCur and Stephen Greenblatt, and the brow furrows in bewilderment as we contemplate the depiction of what Geoffrey Cohen has mordantly called the great before. Polanyi can perhaps be excused since the great age of medieval social, political, and cultural history was still to come in 1944. Uh, for the others, the mischief they have, they have caused is, is less easily excused. Now, in the model I'm building, transformations in psychotropic assemblages are ongoing. I've made allusions to Sapolsky's argument about the historical invention of institutionalized stress in the Neolithic transition. I've noted in passing the market transformation from the Roman world with its theater, temple complexes, spectacles, and sexual proclivities to the world of Latin Christendom. The medieval European world itself was not a static one. And so to speaking just for the 13th century, one could integrate the rise of an accurate theater, the changing forms of female mystic experience, the emergence of public preaching itself in the dense cities of high and later medieval Europe, the developing many for spices, any context where contemporary observers describe moved bodies and compulsive behaviors, that if you accept my research methodology for getting at these questions. So the world before 1600 was always on the move. There's never any great before. There's never any static, traditional society back there. It's, it, it's a fiction created by the desire of 20th century sociologists and historians to find a great before. Having said that, I, I have always believed that stuff happens. And I happen to think, and I know this is a weird admission, that interesting stuff happens even after the period I normally work on. So here's my proposal for a different way to think about the changes of the long 18th century with the insistence, with the insistence that this transformation has to be understood as one of many in a very, very long sequence, hence the deep history. The model begins with a significant expansion in the range of non-indigenous psychoactive substances available on the European market. These products include coffee, tea, sugar, chocolate, tobacco, and later opium, hashish, morphine, and coca. And then the, 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 the model material expands even more in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
All of these products have mood altering properties to greater or lesser degrees. And they are products that first began circulating broadly in Europe in the 17th and 18th century. In their indigenous environments, the use of psychoactive substances is often bound or limited by religious or cultural rituals, where the ritual itself is a form of recreation and recreation is ritual. Shipped across the seas, however, the substances were stripped of their cultural constraints and sold on a market strictly for diversion. In addition to imported substances, the recreational consumption of alcoholic drinks, notably in the form of fortified wines and spirits, accelerated dramatically in the long 18th century. This is when the great alcoholic stupor begins. The effect of the psychoactive revolution, which is Courtright's term, was not lost on contemporaries. Peter Burke uh, cites a passage from the, the German historian August Ludwig Schlotzer, uh, who died in uh, 1809 who asserted that the, um, and this is Schlotzer commenting, the discovery of spirits, the arrival of tobacco, sugar, coffee, and tea in Europe have brought about revolutions just as great as, if not greater than, the defeat of the invincible armada, the wars of the Spanish succession, the Paris peace, etc. The modern science of neurobiology has been built on the human subjects available for experiment and observation. That is to say, on brains and nervous systems that post-date the psychoactive revolution. We don't actually know what happens to a human population when it is introduced over the space of a few decades to a much greater array of psychoactive substances than had hitherto been available. In this respect, the long 18th century in Europe offers us a particularly interesting natural experiment. Let me offer two thoughts about this. First, the growing consumption of psychostimulants across the social spectrum altered the number or sensitivity of brain receptors in the aggregate population. So recent experiments, for example, suggest that people who experience dopamine or serotonin highs with greater regularity require even more stimulants as receptors grow numb. The second thought is that uh, phasic firing patterns, that is to say the patterns that just depart from the normal or tonic firing pattern, and I, 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 as an amateur I think of them as waves of greater amplitude, um, become more, po more common in a population that indulged in psychoactive substances. So in a marvelous conversation I was having with uh, Josh the, um, this, this morning, um, the point came up that habitual use of a psychostimulant can train receptors to generate much higher levels of a neurotransmitter. The, the point, to, to, to pull this all together, is that across the aggregate population, we're not speaking of individual brains because we can't know anything about that, but across the aggregate population, it seems likely or at least possible that brains were being wired in a slightly different way. And from this I draw a corollary or a hypothesis, a research possibility, that the growing availability of psychoactive substances in the long 18th century push the development of new cultural stimulants or amplify the effects of existing ones. So to try to put this differently, psychoactive substances prime the, pumped, prime the pump for a growing and changing array of addictions and compulsions that were more cultural in nature. And if you want, and historians like me tend to back away from these kinds of claims, but if you want, you can translate this argument in, onto historical trends over the past few decades, the growing, where the growing presence of psychoactive uh, drugs, psychotherapies, uh, ther uh, and alcohol among adolescents has helped to promote things that are now called internet addiction disorder and Facebook addiction and the fairly new, um, I just discovered this, addiction to text messaging syndrome. Um, and, and these in turn can push drug use in kind of a, a feedback loop. What interests me about the long 18th century, in other words, is not just the increasing availability of psychostimulants, which Courtright and others have, have, have proven, uh, I think. What interests me is the evidence for the simultaneous emergence of cultural pattern, patterns and practices described by contemporaries as compulsive or addictive. Now again, we have to infer these from descriptions. Um, and the best evidence for the case study I'll be giving you is the uh, evidence that comes from uh, various forms of leisure reading. As the historian Roger, uh, Roger Chartier has argued, travel accounts and descriptions of everyday life stressed the new universality of reading present in all social circles under a variety of circumstances. A veritable reading mania, also described as a reading fever and a reading fury, took hold of the population. 
observers describe this mania as a disease or an epidemic. It's really extraordinary how these metaphors flourish, um, associating it with physical exhaustion, the rejection of reality, and bodily immobility. An imagination excited by reading was readily drawn to other solitary practices, including masturbation. In England, observers thought that reading matter had, quote, remarkable power over body and mind alike. And novels stand out in particular for their drug-like qualities. Observers commented on their addictive page-turning quality and their ability to transform their readers, um, and their ability to transform their readers. According to Robert Darnton, readers of Rousseau's epistolary novel, Julie, wept, they suffocated, they raved, they looked deep into the lies and resolved to live better, then they poured their hearts out in more tears. As William Warner reports, novels were thought especially dangerous for young women, their minds unshielded by a classical education, who would grow addicted to the pleasures induced by novels, turn against a serious reading, have their passions awakened, and form false expectations about life. Um, young female readers were warned not to meddle with romances, novels, and chocolate, <laughs> all of which were seen as likely to inflame the passions. Now, other kinds of literature proved to be equally captivating. Um, and this is something I haven't actually seen published research. I just interrogated some specialists in this area um, who have talked about the avid taste for following politics in newspapers. Apparently, this was described by observers as a mania, a hot fever, or a malady comparable to tuberculosis. Um, finally, there was a huge profusion of uh, erotic literature in the 18th century in many regions of Western Europe. There's a really large literature on the subject. Contemporary fears about reading and, and reading erotica in particular are strikingly similar to today's concerns about the internet, sort of young and old people getting hooked. Erotica in particular epitomized the potential of reading to control the mind. Fears regarding the specter of this sort of mind control crop up frequently in the remarks of alarmed contemporaries. Economic literature about the speculative bubbles of the 18th century, theater mania, which is actually a French term, theatre manie, uh, music. What they point to is a century of interlocking addictions. More accurately, it was a century of the awareness of addiction, uh, because the word addiction itself first developed its modern range of meetings in the late 17th century. And I, I actually owe this to a research assistant of mine who, who tracked this point down. Earlier, the word had implied the state of being bound or indebted to a person. By 1675, it was possible to say that someone had an addiction to books. This was the first addictive substance, apparently, according to the OED. Alcohol and tobacco were soon added to the list of addictive substances, with others not far behind. Now we tend to use it in, 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 in different ways, but it's interesting how reading emerged as the first addiction. As Roy and Dorothy Porter had observed about Britain in the 18th century, it was a century seminal for both the perception and actuality of addiction. So let me uh, draw these remarks to uh, a close. The increasing use of psychoactive substances feeds back into patterns of chemical dependence and a never-ending spiral. But the availability of psychostimulants in, the, in 18th century Europe and beyond may have primed the pump for new cultural stimulants that fed the dopamine reward system. In a sense, the dopamine reward system in the aggregate population was becoming increasingly insistent, increasingly insistent on being fed. Compared to medieval Europe, a distinctive feature of the emerging psychotropic assemblage of the long 18th century was the way in which compulsions, compulsions became available on the marketplace. Some, like reading, were solitary recreations, a category which isn't nearly so visible in the medieval European sources. These uh, joined the continuing thirst for public spectacles, such as the pay-as-you-go theater and music performances, not to mention the state-sponsored spectacles and pageants that remained free to all comers. What are the implications for the nature of power? This is the question that captivated La Boy T, Huxley, and Orwell. When I contemplate my little corner of late medieval European society, what I find most striking is the way in which stress was visited upon enemies in the form of lawsuits and procedures for debt recovery, uh, public insults, uh, fights. This was one of the most visible ways in which power was exercised in this world, and it, it, it operated, on, on, as I mentioned, on, a, on a, what I call a person-to-person -person basis. In post-medieval Europe, I suspect that stress was becoming increasingly institutionalized. Worked 
in hidden ways into the fabric of society, much like the disciplinary regime described by Foucault. But an equally diffuse kind of power operates through the marketing of goods and products that ease stress and provide recreations and distractions. Now, this is true in the most literal of ways. David Courtright has argued that mercantile and imperial elites quickly discovered they could use drugs to control manual laborers and exploit indigenes. But if culture is like a drug, if the effects of cultural stimulants are indistinguishable from the effect of psychoactive substances at the level of the synapse, then we have to include cultural stimulants in this equation. And as Aldous Huxley saw, hedonistic consumption is a recipe for total, if unwitting, subjection. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I doubt that there can be, ever be an end to history, as Huxley imagined. But I don't doubt, in this world created by Edward Bernays and other figures in public relations, that forms of power feed off the capacity of the human nervous system to be subverted. Since this has always been the case, since power has always emerged from the capacity to deliver both stress and reward, what we have in this outline for a history of the transformation of psychotropic assemblages is a new way to connect history to neuroscience, to connect our local studies with our global studies, and to bind our recent history to our deep history. Thank you. So we're fine for time, and uh, Professor Smale has agreed to uh, take your questions. And I, I think I'll let you feel. Sure. Yeah, if that's OK. Why not? Fascinating account of, of uh, what's done to people psychoactively and so forth. Um, but no one seems to be doing it. Uh, are there room, is there room for actors? Agents. <laughs> Well, part of the reason that I made this allusion to Bernays, and, and I, I could have entirely rewritten the paper, the paper around Bernays, is that in the 20th century, and I, and I don't know enough about earlier periods to make this claim, but in the 20th century, there's no question that, this, that the marketing of, in this, particular, in this particular case, the marketing of desires becomes a very self-conscious goal of public relations. We can certainly begin to see active, intelligent agents doing this from, from at least the 1920s onwards. Frankly, I really doubt that previous uh, figures, let's call them, or agents, were unaware of the effects of the things that they did. I, I haven't yet seen evidence where they would write about it, but I wouldn't expect them to, to write about it. Uh, I tend to think that uh, the, these, the psychotropic mechanisms that emerge in earlier societies tend to emerge a little more organically, and then the people who profit from them figure out what they're about and build on that realization. That's, I suspect, how it works. And I've, I've wrestled exactly with this issue, and I don't have any more answers other than that right now, but, but it's, it's exactly the kind of question I've been asking myself. Thank you. Yes. You were saying earlier that um, Homo sapiens in general. Uh, you know, I've, I've just realized that we're supposed to be, yes, <laughs> recording this. Do you, can you wait for a minute while we get the microphone around? Uh, you said earlier that uh, Homo sapiens in general evolved more as a Le not more as less as a survival of the fittest to more of a kind of a survival of the happiest, like to <laughs> uh, being able to partake in 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 uh, congregate and get along in in larger and larger groups, and uh, which seems like kind of odd, like compared to most other animals. And I was wondering, um, like especially when you're talking about like drugs of different sorts and uh, like chemical reactions in the brain kind of changing uh, like the, the makeup of not just like one generation but many. So like was that kind of one of your points was that uh, like evolution is, is slightly different in Homo sapiens than, than it appears to be in the rest of, of the animal kingdom? Well. 
That's a really a biggie. And let me just think about small pieces of it. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the cognitive arms race is about the survival of the happiest. I think the people who worked on this idea of the cognitive arms race have actually talked about as the, the survival of the most manipulative. But mani manipulation involves not only delivering measured doses of stress, the way that dominant baboons will deliver doses of stress to subordinate baboons, but it can also involve delivering measured doses of, of collaboration and cooperation. So uh, you can, in, 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 again, in primate observations, you can find scenarios where dominant individuals will terrorize subordinates and then make up with them afterwards. And so you get this dialectic back and forth between them. So with, with Homo sapiens, it's, it's definitely not a question of the most happiest. It's the ones who, are, who become, not that, not that they're aware of it, but become most adept at manipulating what I call the autonomic communication system uh, in their own interest to maximize the benefits that they draw from the system and, and minimize the input that they put into it. So it's, it's, a, it's a more complex mechanism than simply the survival of the happiest. Um, the, the question of how groups are formed is a slightly different, uh, a, a different issue, and there's a lot, of, a lot more I could have said about Dunbar's argument about uh, large group formation that's interesting. As far as uh, Homo sapiens and evolution uh, go, um, I, I guess what I'm suggesting, one of the ways in which you can think about this is that the dopamine reward system and the stress response system, and in fact all of, the, all of these systems that are operating in the brain, are, 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 are there, they, they've been around for a long, long time <laughs> we share, because we share them with all animals and we know this. But animal societies figure out how to use them for reasons that go beyond a, a, a sort of very simple environmental rewards. It goes beyond food and it goes beyond copulation and things like that. It's used for politics. Uh, and political negotiations. Pr other primates are doing this just as much as humans are. Um, other mammals are doing this just as much as humans are. I don't think it's unfair to say that humans have be become particularly good at it. Uh, and, but the point is that it's an exaptive process. It's a process where they're, they're taking a system that's made available by evolution and using it for other purposes that in the end have, uh, I guess I would say, evolutionary consequences, but not for what they were designed for. And in a very large way, you can say that that's partly what culture is, as long as you recognize that this culture is one that's been around for millions of years and isn't something that emerged very, very recently. Yes, there's a couple of people here, so. I find this a very persuasive model for think a very persuasive methodological model for historians, and also, of course, opens up all sorts of interesting questions about how we study what appear to us to be changing moral and legal systems, and are these really not changing morality so much as changing attitudes toward the availability of certain types of stimuli in a society, or the cultivation of certain types of stimuli. So I wouldn't want to, as a medieval historian, reify the argument about the medieval church as the big brother. But it is fascinating, for instance, that there seems to be an awareness on the part of canon lawyers or the writers of penitentials in the early Middle Ages that certain types of, say, sexual behavior are better channeled toward uh, either procreation or toward uh, the, the public good rather than toward personal gratification, masturbation, things like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And whether, and so, you, so if we think about, say, what people struggle with constantly. How do we understand, for instance, the very different um, sexual morality of 5th century BC Athens yep. versus 2nd yep. century AD Rome versus 12th century, you know, that maybe this has to do with, would you say that that has to do with this sort of, the availability of these types of stimuli and the way they're being channeled by society? Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. Uh, Carol, I'd, I'd love to make this argument. Um, I haven't yet found the materials for doing it, which is why for this particular talk I shied away from it. Um, let me suggest maybe a, a fragment of the way in which I thought about it. I, I've always been fascinated by the way in which, I, I suppose it's a commonplace, the way in which the Christian moral system, the way in which the, uh, in, among the early church fathers, they, they, they begin to the, imagine that the sin of desire and what effect that has on people is up and down the line a, a rejection of, of Roman practices. I mean, this is a, a commonplace. Uh, so obviously, 
the ascetic sexual tradition as a response to the, the sense of hedonistic sexual uh, you know, erotica in the Roman world. So it's up and down the line. It's food, it's sex, it's, uh, uh, it's theater, it's, it's, it's all kinds of things. And you can't help thinking that, that lying behind the system, and maybe this goes back to the, to the question about uh, agency, is this awareness that this is a regime, this is a, a psychotropic regime, if I can keep using this term that I proposed, that works in the interests of a certain kind of power. We have to break and turn and mold that system for a different kind of power regime. I would love to be able to make that argument. The only problem is I haven't yet found the sources saying that that mattered to the laity, that things like sexual renunciation will matter to the laity. And it only because, because this, as I described, the census has largely been high in late medieval, which is the world I'm more familiar with. Um, but it's largely because the sources I've looked at haven't actually spoken about that. So what I'm waiting, this is an, I'm offering to people, this is a great topic to look at. Can we find the evidence that this, these kinds of things actually worked? People felt the stress that we think might have been posed by the Christian moral system. It actually felt that stress and it changed their behavior in some way. Because then we could write about the great transformation from Rome, the Roman world to Latin Christendom, which I'd love to be able to write. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave that for other peoples to write. I mean, I might try to look into it later, but it's exactly the kind of thing I think I'd really love, love to think about. As an aside, and I'll try to be very short about this, but I, I've been fascinated by the, the question of monastic silence that emerges in the 11th and 12th century. Because when you think about the, the sign language that emerges in Cluny in the 11th and 12th century, in light of what Dunbar has argued and what the McGill experiments have argued and Wisconsin experiments argued about isolation, is yet another form of isolation from, from social contact. And it, it's, going to, it, it's going to have to induce, if, if neuroscience has any universality, some kind of psychosis, mild psychosis in individuals. What's that gonna do in a monastic se setting? It's clearly gonna turn them to prayers and liturgies and devotion to God in some way. There's, there's gotta be something there. And so the only, has, the only reason I left that out of that paper is that I don't see the lady participating in that world. It's a very isolated world of monasteries. It works in a monastic context, I think. Um, and I'd love to be able to translate that out. But I'm gonna, like, this is something I hope that we medievalists can talk about, absolutely. I think there was another question right up here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think there's two here, and then maybe we should move over here to get this side of the room. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about your claim that there were no psychoactive drugs in Europe before the importation of cocoa and coffee and yeah. these sorts of things. And certainly there was, and there was rich knowledges of herbology and all sorts of psychoactive substances. So I wonder. Where did those go? Did they disappear or did they never appear in the historical record? Were they actually sort of purged in the Romanization and Christianization processes? Or yeah, the, the only one I know about um, that I've read about is St. John's wort, which, which is known to be psycho, mildly psychoactive. It, it, it appears so rarely in sources. It, it, it just doesn't come up as an item of, of kind of consumption. You don't see it in, in the economy where you know, fields are being turned over for, for the production of this kind of thing. So I, I'm willing to be open to the idea that in fact, the, uh, the, the flora of medieval Europe actually offered more than the people were using. Um, and it's, po it's certainly possible that they're circulating more than, than what my current research has, has suggested that they were circulating. If, if they're available, and, but if I'm right in suggesting that we're not actually used, it becomes even more interesting. It goes back to Carol's point that maybe it's something to do with um, with the, the, the way in which the, the system is very carefully controlling the source of psychoactive substances because of what it is doing for the, the, the sort of model for power that I've been, I've been trying to develop. So I, I, I actually looked into that question and I'd love to know more about it. Uh, be, people are not asking the questions in the way that I've tried to frame it here, which makes it hard to research. You have to go back to sources and not rely on secondary sources. This has been my experience, my frustration. Thank you. <laughs> Um, there's one question up there, and then maybe you could, we could run over here, because I, there's several on this side. Uh. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to just return to the agency question, which I guess uh, troubles me as it troubles you and the other questioner. And to give you one example, um, you know, it occurred to me when you were talking about the great uh, psychotropic transformation, there was one substance you didn't refer to, I don't think, which was sugar which seems to me actually to be the most important of the new substances coming out of new kinds of global um, and colonial exchange. And when I think about sugar, what I think about as the most significant thing of sugar um, is not so much, let's say, the relationship to other forms of addiction like gambling or whatever, 
but the, uh, the primal role of sugar in the creation of plantain, plantation, sorry, slavery, and then, of course, the creation of the African slave trade, 12 million African, enslaved Africans transported yep. to the New World. And so then I think, well, gee, with this model, how do we understand something like that differently or better? Or you know, how does this give, excuse me, give us some insight into that whole long process that we didn't have without your model, if you see what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. I actually did mention sugar, <laughs> and it was only. And I, I talk a lot. I talk more about sugar uh, in, in 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 the book, I think. And I, I've certainly done more research on sugar. Uh, it's it's been so well done by Sidney Mintz in a way that that you know. There's, I didn't feel I could add anything to what Sidney Mintz has already said about sugar. It's it's obviously particularly interesting also because it got mixed in with coffee and chocolate and and, and other things, and this kind of double hit in terms of a. Uh, you know, of a psychoactive, at least mildly psychoactive substance. Um, the answer is you're absolutely right. And if, if, if I could have three hours to do this paper as opposed to 50 minutes, I would have gone on at much more length about sugar and in particularly how, again, I think the point is obvious and it's been made by Mintz and others that, that part of the suck of sugar pulling into Europe and the way in which it created the whole Atlantic economy and the slave trade was built on, on the properties that sugar, sugar had. Uh, the, so yes, absolutely, <laughs> I, I agree entirely. It, was there something I can add beyond that? And I haven't had enough sugar lately. Right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, what, what I've tried to argue is that what is interesting about it is, is not the economy that we already know so well, the Atlantic economy. It's, what I've tried to suggest is what's interesting about the, these psychostimulants is that they have they, they operate in this dance with what I've been calling the cultural mechanisms. The, we, we know the, the, the whole idea of what's going on in the, psychoact the sort of psychoactive world of the long 18th century has long been well known, but what hasn't been linked to it is the cultural twin. They, they've been kept apart. People know about, about reading mania, they know about theater mania, but they don't link it. They don't say there's a link here. And to me, the thing is that that link is the brain and it's the nervous system, and that's where, I, uh, and, and the idea that there might even be changing wiring of the prefrontal cortex and changing patterns of sensitivity to receptors and things like that, that might have created this sort of what I'm describing as a feedback loop, uh, which would have things that were t entirely unplanned by people. As, as I, uh, I've mentioned to several of you already, I, I just aesthetically, I'm really interested in non agentful histories where we can write histories that don't involve thinking agents. And this is purely an aesthetic choice. I just happen to delight in that kind of history. So I don't want to leave the agents out, but I think that's someone else's job. Yes, well, let's bring the... Well, maybe we could take two more, because I think you had your hand up too. For... Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lord Smale, for a very provocative uh, presentation. I was curious if you could elaborate on how the character of the experience that's induced by the drug being consumed um, influences the kind of culture and the discourse and the actions that are produced under the influence of that drug. I mean, you know, the stream of thought that's produced under the influence of coffee is very different in character from that produced by marijuana versus alcohol versus opium. Thinking about absinthe in Montmartre and how that the character of that experience very strongly influenced the art that came out of the Moulin Rouge, um, and also whether you think that the you know the mix of substances that's being consumed, you know, influences cultural divergence. Um, specifically thinking here about opium and how you know that remained a subculture in the West. Very important. I mean, the British fought a war to, <laughs> to uh, ensure their continued yep. supply of opium, but you know, De Quincey's dreams didn't seem yep. to filter through the whole culture, in, in, and they weren't as ubiquitous, it seems, as they were in China. So I'm curious about, uh, about, about that aspect of it. Um, on, 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 the, on the second point, maybe we should just get back to that later, and, and I can get a better sense of how you want to frame that question. The, the first question is a, is a brilliant question. Um, 
I can't answer it. I, I've been talking with people about it, and they've I know, I'm sorry. But, and they've said, well, have you thought about these possibilities? And I, have my, I had all these antenna going, up. God, that'd be fascinating, but I haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> so that, that's exactly the kind of question I, I would really like to ask. I think it'd be interesting, and, and I, think, I think it would lead somewhere. So, but l maybe we can catch up at the reception afterwards and go over more detail. That would be interesting. Um, perhaps this is a <clears throat> too big question now at the end of the day, but uh, um, you gave a lot of fascinating examples from medieval times, but I wonder, I haven't read your book, but maybe you could tell us all, um, how would you link uh, all this idea of uh, psychotropic drugs and, cult and their connection to culture and the connection to the wiring of the brain to periods much, much more ancient? like pre-Mesopotamian or wherever you were wanted to go yourself. And what would constitute evidence for your argument? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the reason that medieval Europe, uh, and the reason that historians like me insist upon the importance of studying medieval Europe is because it is one of the, the few societies before 1600 for which we have this really, really dense documentation. So. Uh, the Ming Dynasty, Song Dynasty, probably equivalent, maybe a little less. It's really hard to know what you're measuring in some respects. Um, there's, there's some documentation from the uh, Islamic world, but it's, it's, it's much, much lower. But these are the th three of the worlds, and there's, there's a few others, but these are the three of the worlds that give us lots and lots of information that we can use to track stuff before 1600, sort of in a way, stuff before the psychoactive revolution or the transformations. And, and that's why it's so important. The ancient world, has a lot too. Uh, it's orders of magnitude smaller than what we have for the Middle Ages, even though it's been orders of magnitude more studied on a word-for-word -word basis than the Middle Ages. We know a lot more about it. Um, when we go back as far as Sumeria, the quantity of written evidence gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and because I'm not uh, an Assyriologist, I, I, you know, I, I, I haven't thought of, of asking this question. Are these these little clues, these inferences we can derive from the written texts, um, I suspect not. Um, and for the Roman world, I, I, I know that it's there, uh, but the evidence is going to be a little thinner. Um, so the, my model, I, I've been trying to build it on the things that I know, which is medieval European society. There's no question that the further back you go, you're, you're dealing with increasingly inferential arguments, where in the metaphor I always think of, you generate a thesis, that's this imaginary pot, and you try to find a few sherds from which you can say that you're, yes, my pot was, this is actually how it should have looked, and if the sherds don't fit, um, then you have to build a different theory. There's no question that we, we, you, in this world you have to be theory building, and then you have to look for the fragments of evidence that, that you can. I, I really doubt that when we're getting back as far as Sumeria, when we're getting back as far as the Neolithic transition, that we're gonna have anything but really, really thin and insubstantial archeological evidence. But the, what's fascinating about the archaeological world is the way that the people who move in that world, I'm just an amateur, really happily construct interesting, fascinating arguments about this. Um, I, and this is, I, I just mentioned Sapolsky in passing, but that are built on, on models about demographic transitions and draw their evidence from primate studies and this, that, and the other. And so there's no question that the shape and the form, these are these, are these kind of uh, epistemological, methodological thickets that I said I was going to gaily skirt at the beginning. I'm aware of all of them, but there's no question that the, that the shape of the methodology changes the further back you go, but I don't think that that should prevent us from doing it or even having an openness to the idea that we have to do this if, if we're trying to, to take this history and put it in this, this long historical sequence. Because the one thing I'm sure of is, is that it'd be really difficult to see what's going on in, in later societies unless one had this anchor and had, one sen had a sense that these were continuous and ongoing transformations and not just a, the, the Polanyi style of everything happened in the 18th century, nothing before it was worth, worth paying attention to. So I, th I, that, that's really just a, a hopeful claim. Let, let's all keep forging ahead and, and building this and, 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 and be open-minded to the, to the conclusions that we, that we can draw from the fragmentary evidence. Thank you. It is now 5.30, so let me again uh, thank both the, the speaker and the audience and um, entice you to yet another round of stimulants uh, <laughs> at the reception in the lobby where you can, uh, you can chat further with uh, Professor Smale. Yes, thank you very much.